welcome to the NCMHCE Exam Review Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Donnelly Snipes. This podcast is brought to you by Counselor Toolbox Podcast and allceus.com Counselor Continuing Education, where you can get unlimited on-demand CEUs for $59 or unlimited live webinars for $40. Go to allceus.com. Hi, everybody, and welcome to the NCMHCE exam review. This is part two of treatment planning, and I'm Dr. Donnelly Snipes, your host. Today, we're going to continue, as I just said, with part two of treatment planning. One of the first things that you need to remember, just kind of in general about treatment planning, is you need to remember to collaborate with the client. You don't write a treatment plan for them. You write a treatment plan with them, or ideally, help them write their own treatment plan. During the intake, you're going to explore the client's presenting issues and stage of readiness of, for change for every issue. So, for example, if they are presenting with depression and relationship issues and they hate their job. Okay, well, that's three very big different issues that we need to look at. Which one are they most ready to change? Let's just pick depression. Okay, if they're ready to address depression, that's great. However, the things that they need to do, your objectives or sub-steps, sub-goals, whatever you call them, to get to that resolution, they may not be as motivated to do all of them. Let's think about something like New Year's resolutions. You know, we want to get in better shape at the beginning of the new year. Well, that's great. That's a wonderful goal. In order to do that, we may need to improve our eating habits, get better sleep, and start exercising. Well, some people may be motivated to do one or two of those three, but not all three. We need to make sure that we think about what they're motivated to do and help them increase motivation. We want to educate the client about the biopsychosocial issues that may be contributing to the problem and get feedback. If a client comes in and says, Doc, I'm depressed, okay, well, that's a big, broad statement here. So let's try to look at what's going on with you and what has changed since you became depressed in order to identify biomedical conditions and medications and nutritional deficits or sleep problems that might be contributing to your feelings of depression. Other mental health issues that may be going on that are contributing to your depression. Does the person have bipolar disorder is the person in a state of bereavement? What is going on with that person? And kind of between biomedical and mental health, for example, could be postpartum depression. Um, that is a hormonal issue that, along with, you know, lack of sleep because, you know, you tend to be postpartum, you're not getting as much sleep as, as you would ideally want. So we want to look at those issues. We want to look at their readiness to change. And if they're not ready to change, they're not going to change. We want to focus on what they're motivated to do. And explore their recovering environment. Identify exacerbating factors in the recovery environment. What things in your environment are contributing to your depression? Do you live in a stressful household? Are you constantly arguing with your partner? Do you hate your job that you're at 50 hours a week? What things in the environment outside of the person are contributing to that depression? We also want to identify mitigating factors. What things in the environment help you feel better? Do you love your dog? Do you have a really supportive spouse? What's going on? What are the person's social supports like? This is going to help them start identifying some strengths that they can pull on. And social supports are really helpful in the recovery process. And we also want to have them look at systemic patterns of interaction. If somebody is depressed, for example, what things are they doing in their relationship that might be contributing to that depression? Maybe this, they have the habit, the systemic pattern of interaction. When they get depressed, they won't do anything. And they sit on the couch and they want people to take pity on them or, you know, do things for them. And people do do that. 
and so that reinforces that behavior we want to look at what behaviors they may be engaging in that are somewhat unhealthy another systemic pattern of interaction that can contribute to mood disorders is viewing things with a sense of negativity so if you're always looking at things and seeing the negative side that's going to tend to put you in a place where you feel hopeless and helpless a lot more often and then we once we go through all of the biopsychosocial issues that might be contributing to that pa that patient's presenting symptoms we want to discuss and align interventions with their preferences and developmental level what does that mean that means you know, we need to consider you don't want to take someone who is 12 and give give them interventions that you would be giving an adult you don't want to give an adult something like play therapy that wouldn't be an appropriate developmental intervention you need to consider not just chronological age though you need to consider their cognitive developmental level if you're working with somebody who has some cognitive deficits if you're working with an elder person who has evidence of cognitive decline then you're going to have to adjust your interventions appropriately likewise the modality is going to be very variable depending on the client some clients will like to do bibliotherapy some will like to journal some will want to go to support groups some would rather die than go to a support group we want to talk about what things do you think might help you and what is the best way to accomplish that if for some reason you feel that a support group is really important and this person really does not want to go sit in a room full of other people because they feel too self-conscious or whatever you might explore online uh, support groups where they have a little bit more anonymity asking the client what do you prefer a lot of clients are not familiar for example with group therapy all they've the only um, knowledge they have of group therapy is what they've seen on some really bad tv shows and group therapy doesn't have to be like that there's psychoeducational group therapy that can be really good there is trauma-based group therapy and therapeutic um, group therapy helping them understand what the options are and what those look like instead of saying you know well you could go to group well what does that look like for this client what types of groups are available and you know help the person understand what it might look like and whether they'd feel comfortable there use assessment instruments to facilitate client decision making we've done other videos on this it is really important to be familiar with your assessment instruments and you know in general what age ranges they're appropriate for and i've said but said it before and i'll say it again you're probably not going to use many of these when you are actually in practice unless your agency is very unique however you need to know them for the test for depression the patient health questionnaire nine is the most common screening for depression now the beck depression inventory is an oldie but goodie for adolescents and 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 youth you want to look at the patient health questionnaire for adolescents be aware of the age ranges that these different screening tools are used for for anxiety you're going to look at the state trait anxiety inventory or the stai the Beck Anxiety Inventory, the Han Hamilton Anxiety Rating Scale, or for youth, screen for child anxiety related disorders or the SCARED. Know your acronyms on the exam. You will see only acronyms a lot of the time. So you don't want to assume that you're going to see Beck Anxiety Inventory. You need to know when you see BAI what that stands for. And I know that is ridiculously nitpicky but it is what it is so be be familiar with those things go back over your notes from assessment class log on to quizlet and find some quizlet flashcards that go over assessment instruments including assessment instruments for career exploration substance abuse depression anxiety and even psychotic disorders for substance use one of the most common ones that you will see is the michigan alcohol screening test or the mast
Another one that you will see, and you'll see I was too lazy to type this one out, is the Substance Abuse Subtle Screening Inventory, or the SASE. Uh, that is really common. I know we used it a lot when I was in um, community mental health because the state required it. And the AUDIT, A-U-D-I-T, which stands for Alcohol Use Disorders Identification Test. Those are probably the three most common screenings that you will see for substance abuse. And in career exploration, the strong interest inventory is an oldie but goodie. And the MBTI is often recommended as a career exploration tool. Again, I can't emphasize enough because you will be selecting some assessment instruments on at least some of your scenarios go back over your assessment class or and or go to quizlet and make sure that you know the most common assessment instruments backwards and forwards as i said earlier we do have an earlier episode that went over a lot of those instruments if you want to look at learn them that way establish short and long-term goals with the client The first thing you're going to do is use positive language to describe the future. Instead of saying Sally won't be depressed anymore, you're going to say something like Sally will be happier. You're going to identify observable, measurable characteristics of the goal. You need to be able to read that goal and anybody should be able to read that goal and be able to look at what Sally has done or is doing and say, yes, she's happier or no, she's not. But what happier looks like to Sally may be different than what happier looks like to John. So what does being happier look like to Sally? So we're going to define this broad goal to begin with, because that's where we're going to work toward. Sally will be happier as evidenced by, that's my favorite little key phrase to remember to put in the observables. Sally will be happier as evidenced by being able to sleep at least seven hours without waking up each night. On a scale of one to five, she will, will feel content, which is a three on the scale, most days out of the week, and will report an increased desire to go out with friends at least once a week. Those are very observable. We can say, yes, it happened, or no, it didn't. The Likert scale is a little bit loosey-goosey, but we're relying on Sally to identify, you know, Overall today, I felt content, which is a three. And she will know what that looks like for her. So she'll be able to use her own um, scaling, if you will. Where Sally is now is a step one. She is depressed. She's not sleeping. She is not feeling content. She is feeling a one on that scale, which is depressed. And is not reaching out with friends, just doesn't have energy. So that's, she's at a one right now. What we just defined was a 10. Now the question is, how do we get from one to 10? And that is obviously a stepwise progression. What does step two look like? So we're going to ask Sally, if you're going to start feeling better, you know, what needs to change? What, how will you know you're making progress? What's the first set of things that you want to see change and sally says she will be happier as evidenced by being able to sleep at least seven um at least five hours before waking up on a scale of one to five she will feel okay which is a two on the scale most of the days and will report an increased desire to reconnect with at least one friend via chat at least once per day okay you know that is doable it is a big goal but it is doable so the next question i ask sally is what needs to change to make that happen and help her identify some of the things that might be impairing her sleep help her identify some of the things that might help her sleep better help her identify some of the things that might help her feel happier or okay as she puts it um, in order to get that 
affective scale up and help her identify a friend she might want to connect with and, you know, how she's going to do that. Ask Sally in the past when she's been able to sleep and felt like this, you know, she met all these criteria, what was different? What was she doing differently? And that'll give us an idea possibly about some things that might need to change. In terms of barriers to accomplishing this goal, she identifies that she naps a lot during the day, so she needs to stop napping, but she is uh, concerned that she's going to be exhausted all day long, and that's a very valid concern. Her body is used to taking a nap at 10 o'clock in the morning, and then again when she gets home from work. So pushing through is going to be tough initially until her circadian rhythms reset. Educating her about circadian rhythms and encouraging her through the process, maybe encouraging her initially, those naps during the day, cut them down to 30 minutes or less. So if she feels like she really needs to nap, then keep it at 30 minutes or less. And that's recommended by the Sleep Foundation. You keep, if you do nap, keep it 30 minutes or less because that's less likely to impair your uh, circadian rhythms. That can help scaffold her until her circadian rhythms get reset so she doesn't need to sleep multiple times throughout the day she wants to or identifies that she needs to cut back on her caffeine after 3 p.m she typically is still drinking coffee up until the end of the work day in order to get through the day which is five o'clock when she comes home and she's exhausted so she has an, a diet soda and in order to help her, you know, continue to stay awake through dinner. Unfortunately, that caffeine is staying in her system and impairing her sleep. Sleepiness is going to be a barrier to cutting back on caffeine. Again, she knows that she's used to coming home from work and laying down and taking a nap. We're going to have to help her figure out ways to push through that, which again could include maybe a 30-minute nap. Also, cutting back, not cutting out initially. Maybe instead of having full calf caffeine after noon, she starts going with half calf. Is it ideal? No. But we're looking for baby steps here. I don't want her to start having headaches from caffeine withdrawal. And that was, is another concern that when she stops using caffeine, she doesn't have it in her system, she gets headaches. So we might talk about how to wean off the caffeine, especially caffeine after three. And that's really what she's looking for. She's not even going to try cutting out caffeine yet. But if she can get basically to the end of her workday, she's hoping that she can get to the place where she doesn't need caffeine. Encourage her to develop a sleep routine. Well, that's one of those things that she wants to do, but she's like, I, I've you know, that's something totally new. I've got to remember to do it. So we're going to talk about what might prevent you from engaging in your sleep routine each night. If she has kids at home, you know, maybe getting them on a sleep routine so she can get them down to bed and use her sleep routine. If she's just going to forget putting something on her phone or setting an alarm of some sort so it reminds her to begin her sleep routine get off social media and start her sleep routine which takes us to staying off social media she identifies that she has a bad habit of being on social media a lot but when she gets on there it tends to be really depressing and yet she still continues to go back to um back to social media multiple times a day, every day. So she wants to start reaching out to people and reestablishing her social connections, but doing it through Facebook's platform, for example, isn't probably in her best interest because when she goes on to Facebook, then she gets sucked into reading people's feeds. And it's, it's just a habit for her at this point. So one of the barriers to staying off social media, but also encouraging social interaction might be to uninstall Facebook from her phone. So she has to go on a computer in order to get on social media and 
to have her select friends on some sort of a text app, whether she's SMS messaging them or has them on WhatsApp or Telegram or something like that. In terms of her strengths, Sally identifies that to help her achieve her goals, she can text her best friend, John, each day. That's good. You know, she has some level of social support system, so that's awesome. She already has somebody she can reach out to, and hopefully that will re reinforce this notion of reaching out. <clears throat> she will take her dog to the park each afternoon instead of going home and taking a nap. Well, that's a strength. She enjoys going to the park. That makes her happy. Her dog makes her happy. And that will also help her reset her circadian rhythm because not only is she not able to lay down at the dog park, but she's exposed to sunlight, which is going to help maintain those circadian rhythms in the appropriate rhythm. She loves to read and she'll start exploring some depression self-help books. She likes learning about different techniques and different interventions. This is one of the, so bibliotherapy is gonna be a good thing for her. Loving to read, liking to learn, that's a strength. She says she's good at planning and is motivated to start changing things so she can feel better. That is a strength, which means we need to help her maintain this motivation and empower her to, develop these goals and continue to work on them progressively. In terms of referring her to the appropriate treatment level, um, in this particular case with Sally, her biomedical conditions are stable. You're going to want to assess that. If they have HIV that is, you know, their, their T cell count is all over the place or hepatitis that is problematic or something, going on that may be confounding the problem, then you need to consider that. One of the biggest issues with biomedical conditions and treatment placement is substance use. If she is actively um, using substances, is at risk of um, detoxification or, or problems from detoxification, then she may need to be re referred for detox uh, referred for detoxification if she has heart conditions for example or high blood pressure that may need to be taken into consideration can it be managed and this is what you're going to ask for each one of these criteria can it be managed at an outpatient level of care outpatient meets one to three times per week for an hour an outpatient is generally individual not always it can be group intensive outpatient is four to 16 hours per week and generally you're going to have people coming in at least three days a week most iop programs are a minimum of nine hours php picks up where iop leaves off in php they are there at least three hours a day but they can be there as many as 16 hours a day, seven days a week. The difference between IO, uh, IOP and PHP is just how long the people are there and how many days a week they're there. There's also a few more intensive services, but um, that's less relevant to the NCMHC. And residential is when somebody is in a state where they cannot manage their situation or they're at risk if they do not have 24-hour monitoring now there are different levels of residential you don't really need to know that for the ncmhc what you need to decide is can this person manage an outpatient once twice three times a week do they need something more intensive but not residential or do they need residential those are really your three areas for the purposes of this exam when you are in practice, you will use the locus, um, which is the level of care um, utilization survey, I think, um, the locus or the ASAM, the American Society of Addiction Medicine Assessment. And the ASAM does come in a format for co-occurring disorders. It's not just for addiction. 
but the locus or the ASAM are the two most common placement instruments you are going to use. And most insurance companies, and most state funding agencies do require the use of one or the other of these things. So back to our dimensions, your biomedical conditions. Is this person medically able to be managed at whatever level of care you intend to recommend? Is their level of suicidality or homicidality able to be managed at this level of care? Somebody may have some transient suicidal ideation. Can that be managed in an outpatient environment? A well, part of that's going to be influenced in the next dimension, which is the recovery environment. For this person going through treatment, are they in an environment that is supportive? Are they living in an environment that is safe? What does you know, work look like for them? Is their life outside of counseling going to be supportive or detrimental to their recovery? M most people cannot or are not willing to say, yeah, it's going to be too stressful. Let me just, you know, take a leave of absence and go to residential. They've got kids, they've got a job, they've got stuff to do. So residential is not something that's taken lightly. But we do need to consider in terms of how much support this person needs, is once a week going to cut it? Or do they need somewhere they can go, for example, every evening in order to get support before they go home to a toxic environment um, after they've been at work in a toxic environment. We want to look at their risk of decompensation in whatever level of care. Can this condition be managed or are they likely going to, you know, become more depressed, become more anxious, relapse with substances, whatever. Are their symptoms going to become worse? What is the risk of that? And a lot of this, we're kind of spitballing, but using your knowledge of strengths that can buffer against stress and help people recover, it's, you're going to be able to make a general recommendation. And finally, cognitive and behavioral complications. Thinking errors, uh, cognitive impairments, and behavioral issues, for example, self-harm, um, addictive behaviors, uh, intermittent explosive issues, whatever issues that might also be co-occurring, can that be managed in outpatient? Or are those things sufficiently severe that they will hinder the person's recovery? If somebody, for example, it has severe cognitive impairment, they may not be able to remember to eat and to take their medications, um, thinking particularly of a client, for example, with schizophrenia, they may not be able to manage their condition in once a week outpatient. They may need something that is more PHP with, you know, case management or up to residential. Possible referrals you need to remember to make. Uh, you want to make sure that you are thinking about what kinds of referrals might this person need. Know your scope of practice. One of the things the NCMHCE is very um, particular on is knowing your scope of practice. You are not a nutritionist. You are not a dietitian. You are not a medical doctor. Um, and what supports are out there? Most clinicians are not going to provide support groups. That is something that's going to be hosted within the community. Referrals you might want to consider. Medical referrals for psychopharmacology, for some kind of mental health meds, for pain management, or a physical assessment. A lot of mood and mental health issues have some element of physical dysfunction in it. So it's you know, ideal to refer for a physical assessment. Um, if you think that there is an underlying physiological cause, maybe you know, in the assessment it sounds like this person has narcolepsy, well, then you may want to refer for a uh, physical assessment or a sleep study. Support groups. You may want to refer to support groups, uh, survivors of suicide, grief support groups, addiction support groups. The Career One Stop is a great place if you're working with someone, maybe a displaced homemaker, who is trying to get back into the workforce 
or somebody who's been in jail for three years that's trying to get back into the uh, workforce, Career One Stop will do a lot of the vocational assessment counseling placement. Social services, refer to social services if they need um, SNAP, which is what we used to call food stamps. If they need assistance with housing, or if they have a family, they may, might also qualify for, qualify for temporary aid to needy families. The take home with social services is, do they need wraparound services? Do they need assistance with transportation, housing, food? And consider referrals to other therapists. If you're working with a client who has concurrent trauma issues, it doesn't mean you have to refer them out and never see them again to a therapist that does EMDR. You can work concurrently with that therapist, you know, in coordination of care. Some people are not comfortable working with clients who have, or working with addiction issues that clients may present with. So you may need to refer out for detoxification or refer to an, a specialist that works with addiction. Now, in the big scheme of things, treatment is much more effective if it is co-occurring, which means the same therapist addresses the addiction and the mental health issues. That doesn't always happen. You do want to consider, you know, what other resources might this person need? In terms of guiding treatment planning, clients often either overlook important aspects of what needs to happen or get too stuck in the details. And I've actually worked with a lot of clinicians that have this problem when they're trying to write treatment plans. Encourage them to think of writing a treatment plan like following a recipe, writing a recipe down, or putting together, you know, IKEA furniture. It's very stepwise. First, you get all your stuff together. And then step one, you do this. Step two, you do this. So ask them, ask them to talk you through the process of what do they need to do first, second, third, fourth, and fifth, and start writing those down. And don't get too caught up in all of the details initially. Just kind of get a general course of action laid out. Hmm. Have clients identify the goals that they are motivated to, to achieve. Now, as a clinician, I might really want to see Sally start exercising and eat better and cut out all of her caffeine and, you know, there's a lot of things I might want her to do that I might see as potentially beneficial. But if she's not motivated to do them, let's focus on the changes that she is motivated to make. For example, reaching out to her best friend, John, every day via text. All right, let's focus on that. And as she starts to achieve or do that on a regular basis, hopefully her mood and energy and affect are going to start to improve. And she might see the benefit of considering making some other changes. Clinicians can help clients see how some changes are necessary for them to achieve their goals. Uh, I worked with one client, for example, who was on probation and you know, he didn't want to go back to jail. He didn't want to stop smoking pot either, but he didn't want to go back to jail. And, you know, we talked about the fact that ultimately in order for him to stay out of jail while he was on probation, he couldn't smoke pot. And so we weren't looking at it as stopping smoking pot forever, which what I would like to see, but that's not what he wanted. What he wanted was to stay out of jail. And I said, okay, well, what needs to happen to stay out of jail? You can't smoke pot for the next 18 months. And then we developed skills and tools and interventions to help him get through that 18 months. And you now if he chose to not smoke after that, then great. But we created mutually agreeable goals. Termination needs to be discussed at intake, and I know that sounds weird, but it is important, and actually most insurance providers require it. When we discuss termination and intake, it helps the client conceptualize treatment as time limited. It's not just, okay, let me start seeing you, and, you know, two, three, four years from now, we might talk about termination. We start talking about uh, termination at intake. This is the goal we're going to work on, or these are the 
couple of goals that we're going to work on. And, you know, this is how long I anticipate treatment lasting. So over the next 12, 16 weeks, this is probably what we're going to do. We also want to discuss termination in terms of episodic treatment. We'll go through this 16 weeks. Does it mean that everything's going to be perfect in your life at the end of 16 weeks? Probably not. But let's focus on this one goal right now and help you make this progress. And then, you know, maybe take a break for a little while and see how things are going. And then if you need to come back, if symptoms return or you want to address something else, then we can go through another episode of treatment. Again, helps clients conceptualize treatment as time limited. We're going to work on this goal for 10, 12, 16 weeks. And we may ab approach another goal for 10, 12, 16 weeks. Discussing termination at the outset empowers the client and increases self-efficacy. I'm communicating to the client that, you know, with a little bit of knowledge and assistance, I believe that you can recover and you have the power to live a rich and meaningful life like you want to. I don't believe that you need me to hold your hand through the whole process. You are able to do it or you will be able to do it on your own. And finally, you want to pr discuss termination at intake in the event of dropout. A lot of your clients, unfortunately, are going to come for that intake session and may not ever show up again. So if you discuss at the outset relapse prevention or, you know, what treatment's going to look like and how long it might be, you're planting a seed, if you will, in their brain. So maybe at the end of that intake, they're not really ready to do what they need to do for treatment. You know, they decide, you know what, I just, I don't have the time to come once a week for the next few weeks or too expensive or whatever it is. They know and they have an idea of what it will take. So then when they're ready to commit to that process, they can come back and jump right in with both feet. You want to discuss progress towards goals at each session. When you are meeting with clients, you want to help them see their progress so they can and conceptualize, all right, you know, we've only got, we've got eight weeks left. And look how far you've come in the first four weeks. Look at all that you've accomplished in order to keep them motivated, keep them moving forward, but also keep them focused on the task at hand. It is easy if you are not following the treatment plan to get sidetracked by anything that the client brings in. You know, Allie will show up on Tuesday and for a session and she will just start talking about what happened over the weekend. And it may or may not relate to the treatment progress. Does that mean we're going to ignore what Sally has to talk about that happened over the weekend? No, but we want to kind of tie it all together. We want to help Sally stay focused. We want to explain the process of termination so clients aren't worried that, you know, at the end of 16 weeks, they're going to kick me out the door and I'm going to feel abandoned. We want to help them know what it looks like for your facility. A lot of places will towards the end of treatment, like the last four sessions, they will reduce the frequency to every other week. And then maybe the last session is one month out. In order to give people more time on their own or more time between sessions to try out those skills and feel confident that, you know what, I don't need to go back. We want to make sure that they know that we will provide referral to aftercare or support groups. It's not just going to be, you know, treatment's over, good luck, see you later. We want to make sure they know we're going to do a warm handoff and make sure that they understand that they can return if symptoms recur or if they're still struggling, if they haven't met all their goals at the end of the treatment period, we're not going to kick them out the door. That, you know, we can extend treatment or whatever it looks like at that agency. You want to make sure to review the treatment plan at every session. This is one of my pet peeves and I go over it a lot with my staff. In order to help people stay focused on the goal, they need to re review the goal, review the plan at every session. Treatment plans really should have at most five goals. You cannot change everything 
at once and expect to do it effectively. Generally, I recommend limiting it to three goals at most because people have other lives. You know, if the, especially if they're an outpatient, they've got, you know, work, they've got dogs, they've got kids, they've got spouses, they've got something else that is also requiring their attention. Let's set them up for success. Have them do one to three goals and achieve success at that. And then if they want to set more goals after that, well, okay. That can be the next episode of care or they can do it on their own. Go over the progress towards each goal in each session. So get that treatment plan out and actually look at it. That way they know, just like, you know, when you were in, in school and you turned in homework and you're like, well, what was the point of that? The client can see the point of having a written treatment plan. They can look at their goals and mark off their progress. And if they are hitting a stuck point, then you can view that stuck point, if you will, as a learning opportunity. So, okay, you haven't made as much progress as you'd hoped in terms of being able to sleep for at least five hours straight. What else might we be missing that is contributing to your insomnia? And what other interventions might you need in order to help you achieve that goal? And we can brainstorm and help the client problem solve. And check in with clients at every session to see if new goals need to be added, which oftentimes means dropping an, one or more goals to the back burner. But sometimes things happen. You know, I had a bunch of stuff that was going at the end of last year, and, you know, I was just chugging along, and I had my plans for work, and then my mother fell ill. And all of a sudden, I had to drop back and punt. The plan that I had laid out, it was a great plan, but it didn't take into consideration that. So I needed to drop back and regroup and reprioritize some things. That's not failure. That is adjusting to life. Now, it's important that you're not just adjusting to every crisis that happens to come along, you know, encouraging clients to stay the course. But when something does major does happen, you need to think, you know, is this worth slowing down my progress on these goals in order to divert my focus to this one right here. Educate clients on the value of treatment plan compliance. Many clients want to come in once a week and have us fix them, but we can't fix them. That's not, that's not even within our scope of practice. We want to help them see that their issues are being caused by a variety of physical, affective, cognitive, environmental, and relational factors which require attention between sessions. If they want to achieve change, they need to practice in and out of session, even if it's something like assertiveness. We can teach assertiveness skills in session, and they may be really good at using them in session, but then they also need to practice them outside of session in order to make it a habit and develop that skill so they can use that in multiple situations because just being assertive in session probably isn't going to help them address their depression or anxiety or whatever it is we want to educate clients that i can pro or we can provide tools and information but they have to be willing to make the changes i can tell them about cognitive behavioral therapy skills until doomsday I can educate them about dialectical behavior therapy or you know, whatever, but ultimately, or assertiveness skills, ultimately, they are going to have to be willing to make those changes. I can't make them make the changes, and I can't do it for them between sessions. They can be, you know, we can role, uh, do rehearsal and role play and practice skills and master them in session, but in order for them to experience change then we have to address whatever it is in their outside of therapy life that is contributing to their to their symptoms which means using those skills outside of the safe environment of therapy clients also need to understand the whys of all their treatment plan objectives and i see this again when people start writing treatment plans for clients then 
they may have things in there like start exercising every day. And the client's like, why in the world would I do that? To be motivated to do something, clients have to see the benefit in it. They need to understand the whys. Why is it that I need to cut down caffeine after 3 p.m.? Well, caffeine has a hour half-life, so at, at least sometimes eight hours, which means it could be in your system, you know, well into the night and disrupting your sleep. So if you want to improve your sleep, we need to make sure that when you're ready to go to bed, the stimulants are out of your system. Oh, okay. Well, that makes perfect sense. Now, how do we do it? But they need to understand the whys. Why am I doing this and how is it going to benefit me? They need to be emotionally and cognitively motivated to make that change. Treatment planning is a very collaborative process designed to empower clients to make changes and take ownership of those changes. Clients should be referred to the least restrictive environment and to multidisciplinary resources as needed. Treatment planning is a deliberate process in which the client is constantly asking, you notice I say the client and not the counselor, the client is constantly asking, what is my hoped for goal? What has helped me achieve this goal in the past? What is hindering me from achieving that goal right now? What strengths and tools do I have to start moving toward that goal? What tools or resources might I need? What is the next step that I need to take in order to keep moving forward toward that goal? What progress am I making right now? What has gone well? And what, if anything, needs to be modified to help me achieve my goal? These are questions that you can answer or you will answer with the client because you know, the question, for example, what tools or resources might I need? They will probably be able to identify some, but you may have other tools and resources you can share that might also help them. So test taking tips. Know your DSM-5. Know it, friend it, love it. Know the whole thing, not just the diagnostic summaries. If you remember or if you've been in the DSM-5 recently, when you go to a section, for example, mood issues, and there is a lot of text in there, there's a lot of narrative stuff that helps explain the course of it, the prevalence of it in different age groups, and differential diagnoses. These are really important things to read and to know. What does the DSM say you should differentially diagnose? And know the criteria. How do you do that? There, I mean, the DSM is a really big freaking book. Quizlet is a great place to go. There are lots of quiz um, flashcard sets that can help you learn your DSM. But don't just rely on Quizlet. If you're not a flashcard person, you can record the criteria on your mobile device and you can listen to it while you're walking on the treadmill if you want. I encourage people to create sample scenarios. For example, John is a 35-year-old male with depression. This is my gut reaction when I read the initial part of his case scenario. All right, so what information do I need in order to support that diagnosis? That means, you know, what are the symptoms that I need to be able to document? What other diagnoses might I need to consider? Maybe addiction, bereavement, bipolar disorder, all of those things I'm going to want to consider. Remember that that information is often found in the narrative part ahead of the diagnostic summary in the DSM-5. So do make sure that you take a look at that and, and thoroughly read your whole DSM. Another thing that you can do is pretend that you're a screenwriter and you're developing a character and you want to have that character, have the people that are watching be able to say, oh, that person's depressed or, oh, that person is on the spectrum or whatever diagnosis that you want. What would that person need to do? What would their behavior look like? That's another way you can do it if you're more creative. You can also... Choose one category per week, like developmental disorders, and learn those. Instead of trying to learn the whole DSM at once, learn the categories. And it is important to know all the categories. Even if you know that you're going to be working in a setting with adults, 
you haven't even taken classes on play therapy, you have no desire, no intention on serving juveniles, you may get questions on juveniles. You may get questions on older adults. You need to know the range of, you need to know everything in the DSM. And I know that sounds daunting. Think of it as a challenge. Just like doctors have to learn, you know, all of anatomy and physiology, we have to learn all of the DSM. That's just the way it is. And don't forget the specifiers. Uh, when you're making that diagnosis, you're looking at that diagnostic chart, and it's, you know, you have to have four of the following criteria, yada, 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 not due to other uh, general medical conditions, okay. But then there's also that specifier. Uh, with depression, for example, it could be with peripartum onset. You want to know, you need to know the specifiers for the different diagnoses that are out there. Because, you know, if you get somebody with postpartum depression, for example, that's one of your scenarios, there's not an actual diagnosis in the DSM that's just titled postpartum depression. It is major depressive disorder with peripartum onset. Take your time. Explore it. When you're watching TV, try to diagnose some of the characters. You know, watch things like Monk or whatever. You can also Google movies or television characters that exemplify, you know, and fill in the blank, bipolar disorder, addiction, PTSD, yada, yada, yada. And then you can go look those up on Netflix or YouTube or whatever in order to see it in action. I hope that was helpful, and I will see you next time. If this podcast helps you help your clients or yourself, please support us by purchasing your CEUs at allceus.com or getting your agency to sponsor an episode. A direct link to the on-demand CEUs for this podcast is at allceus.com slash podcast CEUs. That's all CEUs.com slash podcast CEUs. To sponsor an episode of Counselor Toolbox and reach over 50,000 clinicians per week, go to all CEUs.com slash sponsor. Thank you.